That's right, because I'm sure it'll be an intense discussion. So I want to welcome Stacy. Thank you very much, Martha. <laughs> Well, I want to thank Martha for having me speak, and I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. I think we'll have a really interesting discussion. Uh, the format for this discussion is going to be to, uh, I have about 10 prepared questions up here that I'd like to ask the panelists, and then we'll open it up to you guys for your questions in about 30 to 40 minutes or so, depending on, on how long their answers uh, seem to be. Uh, a little bit about our panelists tonight, Randall Klein, started his publishing career as an assistant in the Foreign Rights Department at Trident Media Group, a large literary agency. He became an agent 11 months later, selling foreign rights in peripheral markets and for backlist titles. Five months ago, he switched over to the editorial side, joining Bantam Dell, a Random House imprint, as an assistant editor, and has since edited four new works as well as numerous reprints. A little bit about Rita Rosencrantz. Uh, Rita is a former editor with major New York publishing houses and she founded the Rita Rosencrantz Literary Agency in 1990. Her adult nonfiction list includes health, history, memoir, parenting, music, how-to, popular science, business biography, popular reference, cooking, spirituality, and general interest titles. Rita works with uh, both major publishing houses as well as regional publishers that handle niche markets. My first question is for Randall. Um, and thinking about who our audience is tonight, I've kind of geared the questions towards you guys. Uh, when did you first know that you wanted to work in publishing? Uh, for me, it was about three weeks before I dropped out of law school. So. Um, I started editing my freshman year of college and I sort of fell into that accidentally just working on papers with uh, people on my floor in my dorm and then gradually developing from there into the creative writing department um, and it just always stuck with me as something to do freelance to edit for people it just it was something that I took to and I learned um, the craft of through that through doing uh, and then once I got through law school, a semester of law school, I realized that there was nothing I actually enjoyed about law school other than working with my classmates on legal writing papers. So I finally decided to give in and just, you know, actually pursue publishing. And that was how that started. Excellent. Uh, Rita, what would you say in regards to how did you get your first start in publishing? How did you, how did you actually enter this profession? Well, I uh, graduated from college on the West Coast and worked for a year or so uh, at an un, uh, unliterary profession uh, on the West Coast and realized that I wanted to be closer to books. My heart was there and the hub of the uh, book world was in New York. So I moved back to New York where I uh, had grown up and it uh, took me about six months to get into the publishing industry moons ago. It was not easy, um, it, the jobs were coveted, and I had to knock on many doors before I found a job. Uh, interestingly, my first job was at Random House, where Randall is, so uh, you might think there's only one publisher around given our uh, strange connection here, but that was the genesis of my migration to back to New York and into the industry. Would you mind closing the door in the back? Thank you. Can everyone hear us in the back? Is yes. great. Thank you. So, the next question that I have is for is for you, Randall. Uh, you talked a little bit about uh, studying in law. Uh, how after um, after you left law school did you come to work at Trident Media Group? Uh, you know, uh, one of the best literary agencies in the world. Uh, again, luck. It was an insane amount of trial and error. Um, I spent a year and a half trying to get a job in publishing and. It was a lot of applications, and it was a lot of interviews, and it was a lot of sending out my resume. And um, I came close a lot of times with a lot of great agencies. And then a uh, job opened up to be the assistant to Robert Gottlieb, who is the chairman at Trident um, and a very, very big, well-known agent. Um, he represents or represented at one point or another Elizabeth George, Janet Ivanovich, uh, all these, you know, top Tom Clancy. He discovered Tom Clancy. And I interviewed for that position, 
and it came down to me and someone else, and they went with her. Uh, and then two weeks later, the job opened up in the foreign rights department, and I reapplied, and I wanted to work at Trident. It was a, it's a great agency. And I went in for that, and it came down to me and someone else, and they went with her. And then she came back to them and uh, tried to negotiate a bunch of strange terms that generally you don't do in your first job. And they then said, okay, we're going to go with this other guy. <laughs> so that was how I, I got into Trident, but it took about a year and a half for me. So right off the bat, you know, it was easy to, to get in. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it was, you, I learned a lot going through it. My resume at the beginning changed drastically from my resume at the end. My cover letter at the beginning changed drastically from my cover letter at the end. And my interview skills. Um, I, I'm convinced there was one job where I absolutely lost the job. I did tremendously well at everything, I'm sure, uh, except when she asked me if I had any questions for her at the interview. I'm like, no, we've really covered it all. And that was Afterwards, I realized that no, I was supposed to have a question there. I was supposed to keep the interview going, um, and I learned from that. Mm -hmm. And now, each time I ever interview or uh, have to interview somebody else for a position, that's always something that I make sure I have going in beforehand. Questions that they couldn't possibly ask me that I can then ask them that show my interest in their work specifically or uh, in the company specifically. I think one of the interesting thing about both of the panelists that we have tonight is that they both worked in both sides of the publishing equation, uh, that is editorial and as agents. And so I think it's kind of neat to, to maybe ask a question or two about uh, the different roles in, in those uh, particular fields. Uh, Rita, what would you say for our audience this evening, uh, can you explain the difference between working as an editor and working as a literary agent? The fundamental difference is that the process starts with the agent. The agent is closer to the origin of things. In fact, uh, I'm finding talent that I'm nursing to make that talent ready for a submittable stage. So I'm, uh, while I prefer that a project is ready to roll, very often I'm shaping it, um, uh, cultivating it, making sure it is prepared for that submission process, uh, making it ready, frankly, for the editor who's next in line. So uh, I'm responsible for the birth at that particular juncture, uh, relying obviously on the successive talent, the editors, the uh, marketing people, the contracts people, and others at the publishing house to help fulfill uh, the, the journey toward book but I'm there at the very beginning. And I should also say that I do use my editorial skills. Uh, I think they're, not all agents have them or are inclined to use them, but given my origin in the industry as an editor, uh, I do size up things editorially. And I feel it's my obligation, in fact, to prepare the work editorially before it goes out, simply because uh, I owe that to myself given my history in the industry. And also because if something is rejected to, uh, for editorial reasons, that doesn't speak well for the talents I am supposed to have. So uh, that's a fundamental difference, that I'm there at the very beginning. I'm selecting that talent who will journey ahead. I'm packaging it, making it ready for submission for the next step for the editor. Excellent answer. Again, our panelists tonight are Reza, Rita Rosencrantz and, and Randall Klein. Uh, like I said, I want to work through a couple of the questions here and then I'll open it up to you guys if you have questions. So if you're thinking of a question, feel free to write it down and uh, that way you can articulate it as well as possible. Uh, Randall, how would you respond to that question? What are some of the differences in the roles between agenting and, and editing? I think it depends on the agent and I think it depends on the editor. Um, there are any number of agents who are, who are like Rita and who do a substantial amount of editing on the work before it gets to my desk, let's say. Um, and then there are a number of agents who don't. And I don't think there's really necessarily a better or worse way to do it. Um, it really depends on whether the agent has the editorial skill um, or an editorial background or doesn't and is willing to acknowledge that and you know deal more with the sales. Um, I think... In, in just my experience, the agent is focused very much on the business and legal aspects of it um, exclusively. You're not really an agent if you're not focusing on the contract, and you're not really an agent if you're not focusing on, on the deal. You can still agent and not edit. 
um, usually to your client's detriment, very rarely to your client's benefit. Um, an editor is the advocate for the book within the house, so they're going to be shepherding this project through marketing and through publicity and through any number of other departments, um, design and art, so that the agent doesn't necessarily have the shepherding abilities within that. They are overseeing it through the author so that the author can focus strictly on writing um, and then the things that go along with that. Could you talk a little bit about some of the uh, different roles that editors might have from the entry level to say five years into their career to you know 15 years? Sure. Um, I skipped a step in the editorial uh, process at Bantam Dell. You usually start as an editorial assistant um, and then you become an assistant editor and then you become an associate editor and then you become an editor and these words mean nothing virtually depending on what house you're at. Um, as an assistant editor I am able to acquire books, um, I am able to uh, submit projects, I'm able to edit books. Um, I'm also though the editor for an author named Rex Stout and Rex Stout died five years before I was born so I'm not actually touching the work of Rex Stout. What I'm doing is when Bantam Dell takes some of his backlist and packages it in a two-for-one trade paperback that we're doing now, I'm shepherding it out through the process. So it's me working with the art department and design and publicity and marketing and all, all these different departments to get it from essentially a, an idea from the publishing office through to the public. Did, awesome. did that answer? It does. Okay. Rita, what would you say uh, are there different temperaments, personalities, uh, character traits that are more suited to agenting than editing? And, how would you elaborate on that if so? Well, I'm on the selling end as opposed to the receiving end, so that's one fundamental difference. Um, I have to have the skills to sell properly, to uh, offer truth in advertising, to not rely on hype, to satisfy the customer, which is the editor. And uh, But I do think, and it becomes clear to me each time on a, I'm on a panel, with many agents, that there's room for many kinds of personalities. Frankly, I was pleased uh, soon into my journey as an agent to realize that, that there are assorted personalities, that there doesn't have to be a cliched, sort of real estate cliched uh, broker uh, attitude, you know, sort of um, rapacious and um, fire spewing type, but rather you could be calm, honest, straight talking, and get the jo job done equally well. Uh, so there, there are probably shades of personality that are workable and familiar within the environment, and then some. And I think, frankly, that applies to uh, uh, editors as well. Randall, you'll be able to speak to that. But mostly, you have to, I think, be able, the, the true skills come down to being able to recognize talent, even in a raw state, to be able to nurture that talent to a place where they can arrive in a way that um, allows them to thrive in an industry that's com more and more competitive, crowded, unwelcoming, and um, requiring more and more skills and uh, energy and if not dynamism on the part of, uh, of an author to, to keep their name active in a marketplace that um, is ever-changing. So, uh, but, you know, in, in terms of personality, I think uh, you, there's room for a whole spread of personalities. Basically, you need to know how to identify talent, how to package it well, and how to sell it. And frankly, to whom to sell it. You need to have the contacts in order to be able to make the business deal without spending inordinate time getting there, since time, of course, is such a major ingredient in our lives. What would you say is the best way to, to build that roster, that Rolodex of contacts? At, at the earliest juncture possible, and this frankly applies to everyone in business or everyone hoping to be in business, to cultivate the network that will come handy, come in handy at some point, if not soon, then later. It means uh, networking with like-minded people and maybe even people who aren't quite like you, but who provide uh, an, uh, another way of seeing to help round out your own skills. Uh, I'm networking every day 
frankly, part of my interest in coming here was to network with you. Uh, I hope you understand that. It's a, it's a matter of increasing our scope of seeing and our uh, community, whether it's virtual or you know, bricks and mortar, they're equally important. It means taking business cards from people who you might get in touch with right away or three years down the line, hoping that you remember the point of origin so that you can cite that and they'll understand that it, it was a real connection. So uh, in, in some ways you should be doing that all the time, not um, in a way that is obnoxious, but in a way that's sort of studied and useful and that will serve you at that point when you are ready to break out and find a job or find new, if you do end up being, let's say, a literary agent, to reach out to those authors who were sort of in formation when you first met them, but now have greater strength in the marketplace and are, um, are attractive to you um, as, as an agent looking for talent. So all the time, I think, there's reason to cultivate community. Great. Uh, speaking of networking and socializing, uh, you can see that we've got this nice spread of cookies and crackers and cheese and stuff. Uh, after we're done with this, which will probably be about 60 minutes total, maybe 75 minutes, depending on how many questions that you guys have, uh, I would encourage you to, to grab a bite to eat and, and kind of mingle and, and socialize and you know just chat. We'd love to talk with you. That's, that's why we're here. Uh, next question is for you, Randall. Uh, you've been at Bantamdale for a short while now. Uh, what is the single most surprising aspect of the job that you could not have imagined before taking the job at Bantam Dill? Um, the sheer breadth of it. You, to see, to see the, the blood and guts of how a book gets made, um, you don't really see that from an agenting side. Um, my, my boss asked me, I, I sold a book when I was a foreign rights agent in the Kinyarwandan language, um, which is a dialect in Rwanda. And the, we are now doing a book at Bantam Dell uh, called Baking Cakes in Kigali, and it takes place in Rwanda. And my boss asked just offhand what language they speak in, in Rwanda, and I answered, but one of them is Kinyarwandan. And she wondered how I knew that, and I explained <coughs> that I sold the book, and she said, and how did the book do in Rwanda? And I said, I have no idea. The contract was signed. I was done. And that, that was basically it. The contract gets signed, and then you're looking after the book, but it's not so much on your plate. Whereas the books I'm working on now are not coming out until summer or fall of 2009 at the earliest, um, as well as books that are coming out in a couple of months. Um, and it's what you have to do for each of these at any given point in the process, and nothing can really fall through the cracks, or else it very much shows. Um, you have a great example of that. Uh, with the Overlook uh, Press thing. Um, so it's, it's just the sheer breadth of everything that has to be done for a book to make it from the author's pen to the agent to the public. Appropriately called the miracle of birth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Otherwise known as a book. <laughs> Rudy, you've got really an, an outstanding list of clients. Uh, thinking about the, the authors that you represent, how did you first meet most of them? Was it through a query letter? Was it at writers' conferences? Was it referrals from friends? Well, initially when I started, I recruited those authors with whom I had worked previously who were not represented. So that was the core base, and I, it fanned out from there. I find clients through writers' conferences, which I go to regularly and, um, and with pleasure. And part of that has to do with just seeing the America through the eyes of new writers, uh, and also getting out of my New York state of mind, frankly. But I find authors now through query letters. I have a remarkable success rate with the projects I take on from that started with a query letter. Certainly word of mouth at this point is a useful generator of, uh, of new authors. But I'm open to uh, all ways. I mean, authors can come to me in uh, serendipitous ways. It could be standing on a bus stop and starting a conversation. So um, I'm open. Uh, it's an open door policy. And I, my list is so wide ranging that uh, people can come to me from their various disciplines and still get my attention, or at least uh, I am open to a conversation no matter 
what kind of book they're writing, if it is nonfiction, and they can defend the reason why the book ought to happen. Randall, uh, what courses did you take in college, uh, if any, that helped prepare you the most for working at Trident Media and at, at Bantam Dell? Theater major, mm -hmm. directing major. Uh, I directed plays, which means that, and it's on my resume, and nobody ever thinks twice about it, but all I did for four years was look at text, pick it apart, put it back together, and then communicate that to artists. And that is exactly what I'm doing today as an editor. And so I was a theater major. I was an English <coughs> major as well, so I read a lot, um, and that helps on any number of levels, but really it's, it's the work I did as a director that communicates today. Awesome. I've got just a couple more questions here, and then we'll open it up to you guys. You do have questions, right? Anybody has questions? <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Rita, how and, and why have you maintained, how and why have you maintained your focus primarily on adult nonfiction? Well, I call my list an omnivore's delight. So uh, the fact that it's limited, if, if you will, to nonfiction is not to say that it leaves out so much. I think of how much it includes. I mean, the uh, the laundry list almost that you uh, uh, noted when introducing me. I am curious about the world. I think my interest in what I do is because every day I'm refreshing my understanding of the world through the many kinds of authors I work with. And they're not uh, easily mistaken for each other. They are different kinds of people sharing different kinds of insights with me in a regular way. And that keeps it fresh and interesting. So uh, I will say that early on in my career, I did try to sell fiction without great success. It seemed way too challenging, and others did it far better. So that, um, that sobered me on the process, and I thought, let me stick with what I do better, if not best. Uh, although I do represent a few fiction writers, I don't court it. I uh, serendipitously happened onto those authors, and um, I'm happy to work with them. But in, in terms of my nonfiction list, it feels so, um, so expansive and still growing as opportunity allows that I never feel like I'm uh, cornered by it or in any way limited. What would you say makes a great literary agent? Well, I, I, I'll answer it somewhat obliquely. I think that authors are created differently and they depend on their agents differently. Even my authors lean on me differently. They, uh, as I say, they can't be reduced to any kind of person or personality. Some have more emotional needs, you might say. Some really want me to negotiate a contract and then be gone. Uh, optimally, I think, an, uh, an author looks to the uh, agent to be an advocate for every important step of the process. And that means, yes, packaging the book, so that it's submittable and saleable, that it uh, help, helps that author find a home that will sustain them, the author and the author's work, possibly optimally for many books, so that that partnership with an editor is long lasting. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, I appreciate when I have a respectful protocol with an author who leans on me in just the right ways, but not in a taxing way, understands that I'm working with multiple authors, sometimes 18, two dozen authors at any given time, and so I am time challenged. And if they know when to weigh in and don't do it excessively, I have best respect for them and can um, serve them in a more happy fashion. But, um, but again, you know, uh, those different kinds of authors look for different things from an agent. And fortunately, as I said before, there are many different kinds of agents around so that ultima ultimately uh, an author, is a talented author, is bound to find their optimum match. And that might be simply who can get the best contract or someone who does better hand-holding or someone who's really steeped in that particular category. Again, I'm a generalist and I'm uh, actively, happily, all across the map. It's what keeps my spirits high. Uh, obviously with some emphasis in certain categories over others. But I will always be that way. I will never be pigeonholed. Someone who is looking for an, uh, an agent who only ha handles health 
will be misplaced for me. If they want someone who knows the editors in health and who has something of a decent track record in that, well, then I very well might be the match. Excellent. How would you answer that question, Randall, on the editorial <coughs> side? What oh. makes a great, you work with, with a heck of an editor in Kate Missiak. I do, yes. Uh, what, and I'm sure you've seen some fabulous editors uh, at Random House. What, what makes for a great editor? Um, tenacity, the same thing I would answer for a great agent, just tenacity. Um, you, you really have to be willing to advocate for somebody else's work, which is what we do. Um, we're not the writers, we're the agents and the editors. Um, our names aren't generally on the front of the book. Uh, if we're lucky, then they're in the acknowledgments, and that's that's a nice feeling. So it has to. It's the willingness to really put in a tremendous amount of work um, on these books, whether it be selling them, uh, negotiating the contracts, handholding to the author uh, to help them keep reworking it until it works as a project to submit. And then on the editorial side, just the tenacity to keep pushing it through the editorial process so that in this just woefully glutted marketplace, you get your book to stand out um, and how you do that. So how do you do it? Answer. If you guys, if you guys know the answer, we're, we're happy to listen. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm coming at it from the perspective I'm, I'm 28. So I look at it from what have I learned in my lifetime about what do the music industry do with digital music and how can we steal that for books? Cause it worked for them after a while. It took them a long time to learn to not fight technology, but once they did, everybody did really well with it. So <coughs> how do we then take that into books? Um, how do we take that into marketing books? How do we take that into publicizing authors? Is a book tour any use anymore to anyone when we have podcasts and YouTube? So it's looking at these different technological, technological changes and how we can bring them into our work. Rita, where would you like to be in five years? I would like to be working on the 14th book for my authors who still have juice in them and an audience that um, optimally has grown even more. I uh, would like authors to enjoy the process, frankly. I hope that, it, that they're not worn down by it, given the demands of authors today. They really, the, the word tenacity certainly applies and ingenuity, frankly, because uh, in a competitive universe, you can't be more of the same. You've got to be different and better. You've got to be able to um, be obviously so. If it's too nuanced, it gets lost in the shuffle, most usually. So um, I, I'm very rewarded by what I do every day. For me, actually, part of the joy is that process of teamwork making something happen that would not have happened any quite like that in any other way. And that rewards me daily. I think I've been sustained by this now over decades because that joy has not gone away. And with luck, it won't. Awesome. How about you, Randall? Where, where are you going to be in five years? Alive. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, doing the same thing I'm doing now. I, I mean, I'm in it for the long haul as far as, as, far as editing goes. So. It's going to morph as far as what I edit and how I acquire books and who I'm working for and with. But I mean, I, I find joy in having a piece of text in front of me and I'm working on that with the author. So if I can keep doing that, my boss has been doing that now for 25 years and she is by no means the longest tenured person on the 13 person yep. Bantam Dell editorial row. Um, I think she is third longest tenure at 25 years out of 13 people. So. I, I have no qualms about in five years still still working at what I'm doing. Excellent. So if you guys have some questions for our panelists, again, Randall Klein and Rita Rosencrantz in the back. We have about 2,000 questions. Please. Awesome. You're in the right place. Um, first of all, do you as an editor ever get a chance to run across an author not being an agent and say, gee, this is, this is pretty neat. This is something that I'm interested in. I, I, I would find this person an agent, or I would give this to them. Or do you just say, well, I'm not an agent, you have to take that to an agent? Uh, no, I do that all the time. Um, usually for friends and friends of friends. Uh, but no, any time. If you can find a good author, um, there's really, it's all, it's all about relationships and networking. If I can find a good author and 
put that author with a good agent, then even if I don't end up being that author's editor, then it, it's a good working relationship to have. So yeah, I never turned down the opportunity to help a writer out. Okay. Can I have a question for our agent? Um, it appears that agents are busy, busy people, very, very busy people. So I'm sure you guys are going to be around for a long, long time. Um, I've also heard, in fact, I got on the internet and the first thing it said to me is, be careful. <laughs> Be careful of your agents. There are a lot of bad agents. Is this a, tr is this a, a statement I can take to the bank? Or it's like, it's like any industry buyer beware. And there is uh, an agency group called the Association of Authors Representatives. They have a code of ethics. I'm a member of them. Uh, you should not be paying a reader's fee to have your work read when you've submitted, uh, submitted it to an agent for consideration. So that's already a red flag. And you, as someone entering the industry from whatever angle, should be aware of the protocols of the industry and what is frowned upon, in fact, what is considered a scam. There are many around. And every so often, we hear about them, and they besmirch the industry. Even if we have our own code of ethics, you can't help but, as you're saying, um, be shadowed by that. So uh, keep in mind the reader's fees. Keep in mind that there are uh, there is a list of questions to ask. The AAR, the Association of Authors Representatives, suggests a list of questions to ask your uh, hoped-for agent, and uh, and I suggest you look at that and you study the, uh, the correct approach to finding an agent, and also finally uh, ha how to seal the deal and what to do before that. It's a great couple of questions. I want to convey and communicate that we'll we'll keep these guys seat belted up here until every question is is answered. Uh, I want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to ask a question. If you have a question, yes, ma'am. Um, this one's for both Rita and Randall. What made Rita decide you decide to go from working at Random House to then be an agent, and also for you, what made you decide working from an agency to then go into Editorial. publishing? Well, it's curious. I didn't realize uh, before we connected this evening that, in fact, we are sort of flipped images of each we other. We have yin and yang here, I think. Yes. And I think uh, today you'll, f you'll find more and more former editors becoming agents. Uh, in fact, there was sort of a rash of that over the last 10 years, uh, mostly because of downsizing. And it seemed the natural next step for editors to become uh, agents, especially if they felt they had entrepreneurial skills and the chutzpah, the daring to do it, and the contacts, obviously. Um, but in my case, as I said before, I very much enjoyed the process of making something happen through the contribution of a team's input, knowing that I had a sizable stake in it and that ultimately I could reward an author with a book. Um, in, in many cases, I have helped make authors' dreams come true, not to be sort of highfalutin about it, but uh, that is completely uh, satisfying. And I still get to use my editorial skills, as I said. I get to set my own hours, which are invariably long, it's true. Um, and I just liked the autonomy of it. it by that time in my career, uh, as a publishing professional seemed due. And uh, I just wanted to call my own shots. So, but I also wanted the freedom to choose projects that spoke to me, knowing that I would work hard to make them happen, and wanted to feel that I could make those decisions uh, autonomously to take full credit and full blame, preferably the credit. And see, I wanted <coughs> less autonomy, and I wanted to crush authors' dreams. So, <laughs> you know, the opposite route. Um, my goal was always editorial, um, and I think a as you go into this process of applying for jobs, I would never speak ill on tape of an HR department. But if you can, always go straight to the person you're applying to work for or with, um, because you'll find that you'll inevitably get closer to the job that way. Um, I applied to a lot of HR departments and I went through the process with a lot of publishing houses and it never quite gelled. Um, and with agencies, it also didn't quite gel for a long time, but 
I got closer to the actual job. And then Trident hired me. And when Trident hired me, it was in foreign rights, which was not my area of focus. But what it did was I basically sat down and I'm like, all right, this is not what I want to do with my career, but I can learn a ton. This is the foot in the door. So I learned how to do a deal. I learned how to read a contract. I learned how to work with authors. I learned how to work with editors. I learned how to work with other agents. Um, and all these different processes that you'll learn just simply by being there. And foreign rights ended up being a great thing because I got to actually do my own deals a lot sooner than I would have if I were working in domestic, uh, on the domestic side or as an editor. Um, but the goal was still always editorial. And after a year of agenting, uh, this position opened up and I actually went straight. I had a help within Trident um, getting an interview with Kate Misiak, the editor I work for. Um, and I met with her first, then HR, and then with her again. And so it was, uh, it was just closer to the goal. And so editorial ended up finally coming true for me. And now I get to make authors' dreams come true every day. Why do you, why do you think it is editorial? What what about that uh, is your passion? I uh, whew, it was. See, I think I think it's it's sort of a different take on on what Rita says about being closer to the work. I feel like as an editor, I'm closer to the work. Um, my my hands are just dirty with text every day, um, and it's just the thrill of working with authors that you're really involved in the process of it, and you're watching a book form, um, and that's very cool. Uh, you get also as an editor more than as an agent. I think I get a ton of submissions uh, through myself and, and through Kate, but it's a lot fewer than agents. It's it's a little more selective. I, I get to see a slightly better grade of submission than agents get to see. They get to see everything. Um, my slush pile is a little less slushy. By the way, I don't call it slush. A lot of agents don't. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I call it my unsolicited query letter pile, because in New York City, I've been known to say, slush is wet, dirty snow. And, uh, and I've found gem in those hills called slush. So there sorry about gems. that, but that's, yeah, no, truly. Could you talk a little bit about the differences between line editing and, and editing for content a little bit? And, and what do you see as your strengths? Every editor works differently. Um, as an editor, I try to go big to small. Um, I look at the whole book, and I, I'm going to start over. Your basic goal as an editor, the one tenant to always have is edit the book in front of you and edit the author in front of you. Don't, don't come in there with a whole bunch of preconceived notions as to what a mystery is um, or what uh, a literary fiction is. A book is going to be in front of you, and you're going to have to trust your instincts that you know what to do with it as an editor. Um, and you're going to listen to a lot of people and take their guidance and, and work with them on it. Um, but I try to look as an editor for the big picture first. Um, how is the arc of the book? How do the characters develop? How does this book start? What's the middle? Where's the ending? Um, and then work with the writer on that. Just get the structurally sound and then go more into it. And this all depends on how much time I have to work. If I have you know, a month to finish it with the editor, uh, with the author, then it's going to be, you know, take a shot at this and then there's a line edit and let's work on this together. Um, but that's very rare. Uh, and then finally it comes down to, after a book is in really good shape, it comes down to a line edit, which is where I go through it and I look and I say, okay, this sentence out of the thousands of sentences, how can we fix this? And then it's either working with the writer again or it's just simply putting it in and saying, do you agree with this to the writer? And it depends on the relationship. Um, I'm doing a book now where the writer really is very protective of the work, which is wonderful. Um, I can work with that absolutely. So everything that I did, it was, you know, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? Um, and he wanted the hand-holding. And his agent, God bless his agent, stayed out of that process. Um, so that we're both very happy with the finished product. Um, and we're both happy with the journey of it because we were sort of in it together. Whereas other authors I have, um, I'll hand them back in edit some notes and I'll, you know, it'll basically just be like, go write. And they'll take that and scurry off into wherever they write and they will churn out something great and hand it back to me and I'll scurry off to wherever I edit and <laughs> I'll send them some more notes. So it's, 
Again, just to return to it, edit the book in front of you, edit the person, the author in front of you. Excellent answer. Yes, sir, here on the front. Um, it's interesting to me that you both work in the agency side and the editing side, and I wonder how common it is, or really for your personal experience, to see an agent author or an editor author or somebody that has taken their own writing and been able to be successful at that while also holding a career as an agent or an editor, or is that an uncommon thing? That's a great question. You want to? Right. I think there are a number of hyphenates in the industry who manage it either because they have a whole lot of help or they sleep very little. <laughs> and sometimes it's just another way to get income separate from the glory. Uh, remember, the industry doesn't, as a rule, overpay its employees. So, uh, but I think some can swing it admirably, uh, very well regarded, and could have a career as a writer al alone and give up their J job. They're so successful at it. And we talked in the car about this on the way here. Um, some, you know, there are some notable uh, industry professionals who have managed that career almost effortlessly, it seems. Editor authors more mm -hmm. than agent authors. I'm trying to think of agent authors. Um, Bill Adler. Okay. I, as an editor, getting a query from an agent author is, I'm a big advocate having worked as an agent and having worked as an editor of having somebody else represent your work. Um, I think that it's it's good to have a different perspective on your work, um, to have a second set of eyes before the editorial side um, adds a whole other ton of eyes to it. Um, so I, I don't, yeah, I haven't seen that many agent authors. I, I'm, of course people can do it. It's, it depends on how you, yeah, balance out you know, are you a singer who dances? Are you a dancer who sings? Uh, so there, there are people who can do both. Um, and then there are people like John Hodgman who were, they, he was an agent for a number of years. I think with Janklau or with, I see, he was an agent somewhere. And then he quit to write full time and he's done quite well with it. And then to do Mac ads, which he's also quite good at, so. For some reason, the, the image of Michael Jordan swinging a baseball bat in the minor mm. leagues, it comes ah. to mind as I think about that. You know, he was pretty good, but you know, his real passion and skill, I think, was basketball. You had a question here? Yeah, I did. I actually wanted to go back to the slush pile. Um, what advice would Unsolicited you Unsolicited manuscripts. <laughs> sorry, of gold. sorry. What advice would you offer an aspiring writer with regards to formulating a successful query letter? Something that's successful, what I mean is, even if you don't take it, um, you don't love the idea, it doesn't end up in your garbage right away. Something that I would recommend you read a book I represent called How to Write a Query Letter. It's just uh, out in the new edition. And the author is Wendy Burt Thomas. And I'll tell you that um, it's almost a given that when I've responded to a query letter that I think is solid, uh, sometimes by phone, if I'm very excited, that the author has been contacted by other agents. That tells me about the power of a good query letter. Now, it's not to say that the material itself that the query letter is referring to will be at the same grade because some people spend a whole lot of time on the query letter. The advice they're getting is make sure your query letter is good. It's your, the introduction to the work. Without a good query letter, the reader won't get past that. Obviously, you've got to make sure that the material itself is up to grade. But I think that uh, there is a skill to writing a query letter one that does not spend too much time apologizing for wasting the agent's time, for instance, and on and on. And it doesn't have to be highfalutin. It could be plain speak, as long as it gets to the point in a strong, clear way. <coughs> there are many books out, including the one I just uh, referenced, but it's, um, it's, it's amazing how many query letters I get. I can't quite tell what the book is about. Uh, there's a whole lot of obfuscating and, you know, distraction, and I'm still not sure what the book is about. That's not a good query letter. Yeah, the standard form for a query letter very quickly, you know, you want it to be one page, yeah. no more than a page. Uh, the first paragraph or two should ideally be a synopsis of the book, introducing the book, then transitioning into a very short bio of yourself. This is sort of the form 
way of doing it. Of course, you can deviate from that. Um, and then trying to close it with, you know, why you're the right person to publish uh, the book and why the agent is the best fit for mm -hmm. the book, I think. And I will say that in, in nonfiction especially, of course, my area of concentration, I do want to know why the author is well paired to the subject and how the book will be different and better and break through to in a competitive marketplace. And presumably just about all categories are competitive and crowded. So uh, making clear why the book deserves to be is a very good thing to argue in a query letter. That's a very good question. Yes, ma'am, here in the middle. For unpublished authors, should that query letter go to the editor or the agent first? Well, I'm, I'm assuming that the traditional way of um, getting published involves uh, an agent. We know that that's not always the case. There are projects uh, that find their way to straight to an editor and sometimes then the author will find an agent yeah. because they want the agent to guide them through the process, be the author's advocate and protect them from the clutches of the editor. So, um, but I, uh, I'm assuming that you are going to find an agent first who will be the advocate who will steer you through the entire process that will eventually include an editor. Unsolicited manuscripts that come to the editorial side, 99 times out of 100, are going to be politely dealt with and declined. I read 60 to 70 manuscripts a month just based on submissions. This is beyond what I read of competitive works. This is beyond what I'm reading to edit. Um, so I, I trust that the agents are filtering through for me and getting the better material to me. It's it's the, the burden of an overtaxed business, but I always go through an agent. I wanna, I wanna come back to um, Rita's answer. Yes, buy the Wendy Burt Thomas book, but the other part of that answer is if you're querying Rita as an unsolicited uh, manuscript, also put in your query letter why you're querying Rita. Um, for example, she represents the Wendy Burt Thomas book, How to Write a Query Letter, and your book is similar to that in respect to that. Um, as an agent and as an editor, anybody who can put in their letter, we know you're writing form letters. Whether you're an author or whether you're an agent, we know that we're not the only person seeing this specific letter. But if there's a paragraph in there that we can tell you're targeting to us and that we can touch on and go, okay, this book is like this author who has done really well for me. So I'm going to take a look at it. Or I really love this author. I'm going to take a look at this book. That's something that is definitely going to get you out of the unsolicited unicorns and gold and cookie pile. That's a very good question. All the way in the back. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, in terms of trying to start yourself out in the agency business, um, I mean, you, um, Randall mentioned you know the, the beginning steps of being an editor, but what are those first steps that you're taking as an agent? Where are you starting in the business? I don't know if that's and obviously both of you can answer. That's a great question. Well, for me, I put out a shingle, and I um, called it day one, and that, that was how it was born. Uh, and there was a building up process, which was obvious to me. There were no surprises, simply because I understood the process, having been an editor, knowing that even the payment schedule to get paid was going to be staggered, and that I'd have to fill the pipeline before the income would be regular. So my expectations were managed. Um, I think probably the safer and saner route would be to, um, to go under the wing of someone else, possibly starting as an uh, intern at an agency, either a small one or a large one, both recruit interns in a regular way, and learn the ropes. The smaller ones often give you the opportunity to learn the various sides of the business because invariably they're short-staffed and people are expected to do more than a single role. But uh, I knew about contracts from my editorial days and much, as I say, of the skills trans transplanted, transferred seamlessly. Now it was a matter of uh, filling in the pipeline. And that took, frankly, you know, uh, a year and a half, two years before there was a client base that I could refer to that was uh, large enough to give me credibility 
and from that point on, it became easier. Um, as far as as far as starting your own literary agency, that's beyond my ken. As far as starting out in the literary agenting world, you become an assistant, um, and my advice would be to not to not narrow yourself down to large agency, small agency at first, because I think there's a lot of benefits to working in a large agency first. Um, I learned contracts at my own pace because we have a contracts department at Trident, so I was able to basically pick up what they were already doing as their job um, rather than having to do it myself, which you would have to do at a smaller agency. Um, I was part of a five-person foreign rights department, which is larger than a lot of publishing houses, um, and this was a literary agency. So it enabled me to learn at my own pace. Um, and that being said, a lot of my colleagues at Trident who are assistants found that in a large agency, your opportunities for advancement are very slow and it's very difficult. Um, there were, when I started, 11 uh, assistant positions and two mid-level positions before you became an agent. So that means that nine people are not going to be an agent at Trident. Um, and a lot of those people went on to work in smaller agencies. Um, and what they would do is they would work the foreign rights for the smaller agency. They would do all the sub rights, the first serial rights. They would do the contracts work. And it's a smaller client list, so it's not overwhelming usually. And then they would also start to build their own list under the wing of the more established agent. Uh, and Everyone I know who's done that has done incredibly well with it. Another thing I just want to mention is the matter of taste, mm -hmm. to know your taste, because often you're asked for uh, to evaluate uh, a manuscript for its viability in the marketplace. So you have to have some notion about what the market is and what's <coughs> selling and what is good and uh, what changes might be needed to make it better than it is, in fact, to make it saleable. Uh, so I think when you're in that learning mode, in some ways you've got to be a sponge when you're working, let's say, for an agency. You've got to be a sponge soaking up the, uh, the atmosphere around you, hoping that in the end you're actually developing your tastes so you can have opinions that count because you'll be asked for them and that will be what helps make you count as, uh, as a, a source for authors and as a, um, a participant in the agency. Uh, the, uh, and, and frankly, this is what we do every day. We make decisions about what stays and what goes. And it comes down to knowing marketplace, knowing how to make a work better, if not great, uh, knowing what can't work, at least maybe not now, because it, it is a crowded marketplace, and knowing how to articulate it so that it's more than um, a simple, you know, no, uh, but rather, uh, you know, an articulated, um, explored notion about why something can work and why it can't. And I think that gives you staying power when you come to grip with your taste. Um, I will also say that I'm aware of agents who maybe are working in the children's book industry now, uh, working with children's authors, because when they were getting into the business, they saw a greater need for children's book agents. There was, it was less competitive and that market was starting to grow. So they were adaptable. They didn't necessarily set out looking to specialize in that area, but they saw opportunity and they seized it. And ultimately, their taste was able to accommodate that opportunity and they were successful doing it. So a certain amount of flexibility in your vision, um, but also an understanding of your taste in to, uh, together can help you forge a career. That's a great answer. Uh, it's about five minutes to seven. I, I want to push this until about maybe 10 minutes past if there's enough questions to, to fill that time. Uh, but I don't want folks falling asleep on us here. Uh, so uh, if there are other questions, yes ma'am. Um, I have two questions. Um, my first question is for Randall specifically because I want to get my foot in the door also into mm -hmm. long publishing. But um, the I'm looking to go into the editorial department, and the it, it seems like because I you know I browse through the jobs every now and then to see mm -hmm. what they're looking for exactly. But since you're actually there, yeah. I'd like I'd like your take on it. Um, uh, I think it's assistant editor, right? No, edit, editorial. You'll assistant. You'll probably be starting as an editorial, editorial assistant. Editorial assistant yeah. is the one that's kind of like been the door, and I see that you guys have like an internship program. Yeah. I emailed about that. I haven't heard back in like three weeks, but that's okay. Who, who'd you email? 
Well, basically, it's the site is still set up for this. It's it's it hadn't it doesn't address this upcoming summer yet. Okay. And I just wanted to know ahead of time, like when are you going? When is that going to be updated? And when is the deadline going to be? I but, so it just said, yeah. you know contact us and then a little email, but. The internship program at Random House, I know it's it's very prestigious and it's very well run. Um, I don't know how one gets into that. I think that was one of the reasons why I, it took me a year and a half. Um, I didn't have a program like this one. I wasn't in a program like this one, um, and I didn't have an internship. And uh, the newest audio rights agent at Trident, I remember her first day as an intern uh, like a year and a half ago. So she's done really well for herself starting with that foot in the door of, of working for free essentially one summer. Um, as far as how internship programs run, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I don't want to give you bad information. I think the best thing to do is if you have a connection in Random House to have that person, yes, <laughs> uh, somebody who's been there for longer than five months, ideally, um, have that person advocate for you as far as just getting your resume to the top of the pile or getting you information as far as when they're looking for interns. But as, um, as an editorial assistant, yeah. other than, because I'm pretty sure most of the resumes, I don't know, but they look, they say mostly the same thing. And the cover letters say essentially the same thing, but in person, what, what's, what's, what, what's the, ooh, this one, yeah. When you go for an interview? When you go for an interview, always have a question or a couple of questions. Um, always research who you are interviewing with. Um, just a show of hands, uh, was this publicized as far as who's going to be on the panel beforehand? A little bit, I think. A little bit? Who here knows more than one author that Rita Rosencrantz represents? Anyone? I did a little bit of research this morning on the internet. I found in three minutes an interview she's done on uh, Agents and Editor Insights for Getting Published, which has a whole bunch of material. I found her web page, uh, which has all of her client lists and everything that she represents. Um, I have uh, access to Publishers Weekly, which I think is like a $20 per month uh, subscription fee, and that's great to have if you can get that. Um, and that gave me the ability to type in her name and see every deal that she's done in the, how, that she's announced in the past couple years. An important distinction. <laughs> yeah, that she's announced. That that is actually huge when yeah. you, if you are researching that. Um, and it would enable me to go in there and not be blinded by it. So that a I would know that if I'm interviewing with her, I don't want to talk about my love of fiction because that's not going to help her. Um, mm -hmm. But same at Random House, I, I did a lot of research on who Kate represents, uh, or who Kate edits, I'm sorry, who Kate edits, and what type of books those are, and I was struggling. We have very different tastes as far as what she edits and what I had been reading for the past X number of years, but it was going in there knowing what she did, mm -hmm. um, and being able to address that and what I could bring to that. And it was also looking at my resume and seeing what are the weak points here, what are going to be perceived as the weak points and figuring out how I can make those my strengths, like being a theater major, which is really unemployable in most senses, but I could you know, tie that into directing, and here's what I did, and here's how you work that. Um, so research, research, research. Don't be creepy about it. Don't ask them, like, <laughs> how was your ride in today from Queens? But um, you'll find, if you just Google a name, uh, virtually any literary agency is going to have some type of web page or there's going to be author bulletin boards as far as like who submitted this to this agent and what does this agent represent and you'll find a lot of great information. Okay. Does that sorry. help? Yes, it does. Um, I just have a question. As far as book reviews, like when a book gets sent out to different reviewers, who who deals with that? Is that more the agent or is that some other part of the publishing app that has nothing to do with editorial? Publicity, well, obviously Randall could answer that, but publicity handles the review copies for all intents and purposes. It's not to say that if an uh, agent doesn't have a contact, you know, they won't make um, it happen that way. And certainly agents, that's another uh, available <laughs> resource that a, an agent, in theory, brings to the table. 
but uh, mostly it's the publishing, de um, it's the publicity department making that happen. That's, a, that's yeah. a great question. It makes me think of a question too I've wanted to have answered for a, a little while. What's the difference between the marketing department at a publisher and the publicity department, or are they the same? It depends on the house. Um, it, it depends uh, as far as how they're going to market this book. Um, it can be everything from how they're positioning this book. Is this book is this book women's literature? Uh, is this book chiclet? And it can be how we organize the copy that goes into that. Because everything that you read in a book, from what's on the jacket copy to the blurbs on the back, the order of those quotes, that all gets dealt with. None of that is arbitrary. Um, and it all, it all comes down to the editor at one point or another. So the marketing department does this amazing job of, of filtering through the giant pool of books and figuring out who are the successful authors that this book is similar to? How do we get that audience to read this author? Um, or if it's an established author, how do we build that audience? Whereas the publicity department is taking a lot of those cues and they're also adding some of their own. How do we get this author reviewed um, by the big houses, by the big papers and the big sources? Uh, how do we get this author's name out there? And then, I mean, there's the promotions department. Uh, one of the books I'm doing, it, it's called Tomato Rhapsody, and the promotions department hand me this this copy of what's going to be tomato seeds that they're going to send out with copies of the book. It's, it's just a cute idea, and it's going to get people to read the book more likely, and they'll be more likely to review it. Um, so it's all these different departments working together, and there's overlap, but I think marketing is more for the positioning, and publicity is more for how to get the author out there and reviewed. How would you respond to that, uh, Rita, from your experience? Um, like you said, it's different at different houses. Right, and, and frankly, I rely on my author more than anything because as I've said repeatedly, at the end of the day, it's the author's book. I don't mean to hedge your question, but I feel most comfortable and confident when I know that the author is a dynamo and ready to be tireless in a competitive marketplace. Now, more and more with nonfiction, I can only sell the book if that dynamism is proved in advance. So it's more than promised, it's proved. Because they have a history of talking in front of audiences, um, a lecture circuit, what have you, uh, making clear that the audience is already ready for that book. So that's the order of things. And uh, when I can rely on the author, I believe that in the end, at the uh, end of the day, the, off, the book will have the best chance in the marketplace. Keeping in mind that even when that publicity and marketing team is on overdrive for the author, they're going to give maybe a three month, four month, if you're lucky, because the book is doing especially well, like Eat, Pray, and Love, for instance, where probably there's still an active publicity campaign for it. Um, that the publicity and marketing will dry up after a spell. I'll have to rely on that author to keep that interest going. So again, at the end of the day, I'm relying on the author almost first and foremost. And when the publisher uh, is in sync with that, if not driving that, all the better. So really, again, it's the author. We maybe have time for a couple more sort of formal questions. And then, like I said, you know, we're going to break up and then if you want to have some FaceTime and, and mingle and chat, uh, we'll have some cookies and some cheese and crackers uh, in a few minutes here. Are there one or two more uh, questions, maybe from a couple of folks that we haven't heard from here in the, in the pink? Um, as far as interviews go and going for interviews, um, if you don't have an internship in a publishing company, like for instance, I'm a communications major and I just got an internship at a, a small radio station, Star 99.1, they will if you make them um, it's a weakness on your resume if you think it is so make it a strength if you can think of how your internship there would work as to being an intern or working at a publishing house then they'll see that as well they'll see a you're hardworking because you're willing to do in theory unpaid labor um, which is a lot of publishing right there um, and then they'll they'll see that you're working in an artistic field uh, that has a business aspect to it so you can definitely turn it into a strength especially if you get the radio station to interview authors mm. Mm -hmm. all the way in the back here uh, thank you. the 
book publishing industry is certainly people outsourcing to freelancers chunks of the editorial process to copy editing and proofreading. Given that so much of the line editing, the, the, the final editing is done by freelancers, might that not be a way for people who are spending their year, year and a half trying to get in-house to build a resume and practice the skills and build a portfolio as, as you're waiting to get a job? How do you get those freelance jobs, though, for the large houses? We don't. We don't freelance our, our line edits. Um, we freelance, and again, I, I'm not even sure if the term is freelance for us. I'm not sure if we don't just have a roster of outside copy editors. So the people that handle the grammar aspects of it and the formatting aspects of it, um, which God bless them, I don't know. I, I have my Chicago Manual of Style and, and my copy editors. Um, so th those people I know, you can go through houses um, and it'll take a while to find who the right person is to apply to, but houses will give you a, a test of some sort of grammar test, and you'll do some sample work, and then you'll send it back in, and they'll then add you to the roster or, or not. But You do that at home, right? They send you... Yeah. yeah so you're not yeah. going in to be tested. The test comes to you. Yes. You take the test, you send it back. Yes. So you just, through HR, ask about... <laughs> Um, if you have a connection at the house, definitely go through that. Uh, otherwise, yeah, go through go through HR and ask them uh, how you would go about getting a freelance copy editing work. Um, the other thing to do, and this is one of the best pieces of advice I heard, uh, it, I forget who told it to me, but the phrase they used was love letters, um, which again sounds a little creepy. But if if you really like an editor's work, if you do some research and find an editor's work or an agent's work and you admire it, send them a letter and just say, I'm a really big fan of the work that you do. If any jobs come up, please keep me in mind. And that's not generally going to make an agent go, I'm going to create a position for this person because I like their gumption. But what it's going to do is if they then have a position open up and you apply for it, you have a connection to them already. Um, and that's going to impress. Um, so really, if you can find anybody at the house that you even have a vague awareness of, send them a letter and just, uh, I mean, talk about their work and then put it in there that you're looking to become a freelance editor uh, for copy editing and you know that the house does some outside freelance copy editing. How can you go about applying for that? 